Hello and welcome everyone. This summer we are really looking forward to the Olympics in Paris. Inspired by the ancient Olympic Games in Greece, the first modern games were held at the turn of the 20th century. Prior to this, some early forerunners were hosted in unexpected places, including the Cotswolds Olympic Games in 1612, the Much Wenlock Olympian Games held in Shropshire in the 1850s, but as we will hear, Radley has had its own important connection to this global celebration of sporting prowess. Before we move on, a few housekeeping items for you. Please keep your microphones on mute, except if you are contributing. This is just to avoid any disturbance on the call. This is an interactive session, so please do share your thoughts with us. There's a chat function at the bottom of the screen, or you can stick your hand up um, in your video if you've got your video on, and we will look out for you. The event is being recorded and will be made publicly available for those who can't join us. Now I'll hand over to our wonderful college archivist, Claire Sargent, who will take us through Radley's connections to the Olympics and the Radley Olympians. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Sophie. Well, we've been uh, part of the Olympic Games almost from the very beginning. So I'm going to go through it simply chronologically, but I think we'll find that there are a number of themes that we can pick up as we go through. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the images should come up. Okay. So we're screen sharing. Now, as uh, Sophie has said, the Olympic Games goes back, the idea of the Olympics as um, all sorts of sports, thinking about uh, the idea of uh, ancient Greece and so on, goes right the way back to the 17th century. Uh, and Pierre de Coubertin, who founded the modern Olympics in 1896, actually also took a lot of ideas from the much Wenlock games of the uh, which he witnessed happening in the 1860s. And I was quite amused to see that the um, the mascot for London 2012 was actually named Wenlock in memory of that. So Radley wasn't there in 1896. What happened the next few times, there was uh, an attempt again at an Olympic Games in 1900 in Paris as part of the Paris Exposition. And then it went to America, to St. Louis, Missouri, again, for a um, part of an exposition. Uh, and there was a little bit of a complaint that the Games in America had 600 plus participants, of whom more than 500 were Americans. So the international nature of it came a little bit into question. And so what happened was that they founded, they had a go at refounding. And we ended up with this that was called the Intercalated Games, the, only, the first and only, which was held in Athens in 1906, just going right the way back. They had the first, um, Pierre de Coupardin's first games in 1896 was in Athens, uh, and they came back to Athens here in 1906. And there were, from the point of view of uh, Great Britain, Obviously, we've not got a team GB at this point. What we heard was that people could apply from all of their different countries. So we had an England team uh, coming to do things and so on. So we're going to look at those a little bit. Uh, but the British Olympic Association was formed in 1905. And one of its founder members was Theo Cook. I'll come back to him in a minute. Uh, Theo Cook, he was a founding member of the British Olympic Association and there were seven sports which were uh, part of, uh, at that time, cheap Team GB's uh, contribution. And obviously what you think of with the Olympics is that sort of sense of ancient Greek sports, discus, javelin, running, uh, wrestling, some of those things. But there was also a sense of gentlemen's sports of the time. And one of the first seven sports was fencing. So what we've got on the screen here is this wonderful silver plaque that we have in the archive. Um, 
the English, I don't have to move my Zoom thing, it's going right across it. Uh, the English international fencing cap and the flag worn as a badge on the left arm. So at one stage, we clearly owned these uh, and had them on display somewhere in Radley as they were given to Theodore Andrea Cook, captain of the English Epe team by Queen Alexandra before the fight which the English won against the Germans in the presence of the King at the Olympic Games in 1906. And the names are Lord Desborough, Sir Como Duff Gordon, uh, Newton Robinson, Lord Howard, T.A. Cook. And here is the Epe team. And right there, second in is Cosmo Duff Gordon, Bradleyan, who fought right the way through in the matches. And in the center, Captain Theo Cook. And Theo Cook was very much instrumental in, in building up the whole I, uh, Olympian ideal. How did they do? Well, as it said on the silver plaque, we have a photograph of England v Germany. They lost, Germany lost 9-2. England went on to win silver, losing to France in the final. So here is the match. And here is that first Olympia 1906 silver medal. It was the first to be awarded. That was 1906. This gave an impetus to the London 1908 Olympics. And Theo Cook, as um, a member of the British Olympic Committee, was absolutely central to how the Games was going to be organized. He actually wrote the books about it. He wrote up the reports on how the Games had gone. He made a point of giving uh, copies of two of his books to every boy in Radley College so that they could understand what the Olympics was all about. But you'll notice we had other people who were also part of it. Frederick Whitworth Jones became the secretary and the honorary treasurer to the British Olympic Committee. Um, and Norman Leith Hay Clark, who was the person who presented the King's Oak Leaves to the prize winners. So that was, as we now have, um, a wreath that goes out, sometimes of olive leaves. And I think in, um, in Tokyo in uh, 2020, it was um, sunflowers. But here in London, it was the oak leaves. And so the Radleyans are right there at the heart of it. But you notice it's also part of um, the Franco-British exhibition at Shepherd's Bush. But there's more. We have R.S. Bradshaw. Now he was the first of our rowing coaches. And this lovely article here from the Radleyan what could London Rowing Club have done without Bradshaw? He, was, he won the grand for London when crews were crews and rowed twice in the ladies' plate for Radley. Excellent sound coach, a generous patron. And here he is in the Radley team photo for the 1880s. Uh, too quickly. And H.A. Stewart rowing bow, which was practicing for the Olympic regatta. And here again, he is in the Radley 1896 crew. So our, our rowing um, prowess for the Olympics starts right back there in 1908. And I think this is one of the themes that we want to look at all the way through here is the, um, the officials and the coaches and all that background work that goes on. It's not just the people who win medals, but the people who participate, this is the whole nature of the Olympics, isn't it? It's, it's actually taking part in whatever capacity. And certainly one of the things that um, Theo Cook did was that he got boys from Radley down into London to help. They're not only giving out oak leaves, uh, but they're also um, standing there, they're, they're being the guys who are sweeping the track, they're handing out tickets, they're looking after the crowd, they're doing all of that stuff. And they're part of the whole experience of being part of the Olympics. So we've had our fencers, we've had our rowers. At 1908, we have our first 
gold medal. And this is John Yate Robinson from Radley in 1899, who won gold with the England hockey team. And this was just an England hockey team. So this is the team. And this is Robinson's uh, photograph from the War Memorial. So he died of wounds in Mesopotamia in 1916 at the age of 31. One of the things we've been looking at at the moment is if we want a new name for some of our hockey pitches, and we have suggested that we should name one of them in honor of John Robinson. We, I doubt we could get a more um, prestigious early hockey player. And it's worth thinking that hockey was actually something that Bradley started to play as a team game only in the 1880s. So it's a very new game for the school. And already we've got somebody who's playing for the team there. Moving on to Stockholm in 1912, and we've got our next fencing master, Augustus Fitzclarence, uh, who, again, this is a war memorial photo, died in Dardanelles in 1915. But he uh, represented the army at Sabre um, right the way through from the time that he started at, um, as, as an officer in the army. Uh, he was well regarded as a sportsman at Bradley. And there he is over in 1912 already representing us. The games then stop. In 1916, they were due to be held in Germany and they were cancelled. But one of the things that Pierre de Coubertin absolutely refused to do was to expel Germany or any of their colleagues, um, uh, their, their allies, from being part of the International uh, Olympic Organization or the committee. He said this is about peace, it's about international uh, relations. And people actually have uh, kept on, um, he kept them on. So it was not until 1920 that we get the next Olympic Games in Antwerp. Because of Pierre de Coubertin's uh, attitude towards keeping Germany in the games, Theo Cook had actually resigned. He had been, he was a journalist who was very, very heavily into uh, promoting the war, exposing some of the atrocities that uh, Germany was committing in Belgium, particularly in 1914, 1915. Uh, he was accused of warmongering because of the way that he did things. Uh, and he resigned from the International Olympic Committee because of Germany's inclusion. He tried to come back. Uh, and in Antwerp in 1920 was a really political games. It was chosen to be in Antwerp because the city was still um, damaged, but really badly bomb damaged by the war. Antwerp 1920 is the start of a lot of the uh, Olympic traditions that we recognize, things like the parade of athletes with all of their, uh, their flags, part of the, um, the beginning of the Olympic torch. A lot of those sort of ideas come from Antwerp. And one of the things that were also in, uh, part of that was the art Olympics as well. And Theo Cook was, um, won the silver medal for literature here in the 1920s. He came, he came in 1920 Antwerp. He came back specifically to be part of this because of the peace movement. It was also um, the, the first time that uh, doves were released at the Olympics as a sign of peace. So the politics of the Olympic movement comes in very, very early. His poem, uh, I've spent a while today trying to find a copy of it, and there's, uh, there's absolutely no sign of it. It possibly buried deep in one of his very, very many books, but I couldn't find a copy today. But the point about it was that it was called the Olympic Games of Antwerp, and it's a fully political um, poem 
about the evil of war. It's very dark, it's very sophisticated. It is not what they were expecting as literature for the Olympic Games, but that's what he wrote in Antwerp in 1920. Let's actually talk about peace and the Olympic movement. But what also came out of that, this lovely thing here in the Red Lee, and again, the King's message sent to Downham, now appointed as chairman of the British Olympic Council. And the appeal is for funds, not just on behalf of the Olympic Games, but to provide playing fields throughout the country. We want to really push the idea of sport, outdoor exercise, recreation, physical and moral welfare of the people. One of the things that came out of the First World War was how particularly uh, those who were living in cities and the poor were very, very unhealthy. They were very short, there's a lot of rickets, all of those sort of things. And one of the things was to say, okay, we've got this Olympic movement, let's use it to get everybody out and out in sports fields. And one of the things that actually people saw with um, war memorials was how many of those are devoted to sport. You have um, gay playing fields, you have pavilions and so on. And here's Be Social in 1918, showing you how it's done. Absolutely out there doing their physical exercises up and down, just out on the pitches. So there's an awful lot that came out of Antwerp 1920, these, the school um, playing fields movement for state schools and uh, people all through the country, the idea of peace, the idea of um, a lot of the ceremonial that we associate with the Olympics. Claire, I've just noticed that David um, has taken yeah. his microphone off and I wonder if, David, did you have a comment that you yeah. wanted to make? Um, not at this moment, no. <laughs> no problem, thank you. No, okay. Do please do chip in. I mean, I, I'm just burbling here. So if people really want to say something, comment or something, uh, if you feel uh, that I'm not getting it right or that there's something that you can add, then please, please do just just chip in with the with the discussion here. So we can see the kind of activities that are going on. By 1928, we've got Frederick Chauncey of 1919, seeing the effect of some of those um, sports fields. We've got the hurdles going on. Moving on to Los Angeles, and the school is starting to look at um, coaches who can come over for athletics. So we've got this Captain Ames, who was the British Olympic running trainer uh, for 1931 in Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles Olympics obviously were in 32, but he was there um, beforehand getting them ready. So we're looking to bring Olympians into, um, into coaching and teaching within the school. And then again, we hit a moment of a war and politics, the Berlin Olympics of 1936. This is actually the moment where um, I said the Olympic torch wrongly for Antwerp. It's actually 1936 that the whole idea of the Olympic torch comes in, lit in Greece by a, a Greek woman representing a priestess of Hera, um, brought uh, first from a, a, a Greek athlete and then across. And it was part of uh, pushing the Aryan idea of of classicism, it's, it's, it's actually a, a slightly Nazi idea to support the idea of the Third Reich, which is a great pity because I think it's an absolutely beautiful thing. And I'm really glad that we've forgotten that that's the gate, that's the point. But one of the things that we have here is KLF Wilson, who went to the Olympic Games in Berlin as part of the British public schools. So we've got a youth sports here. Now the Youth Olympics was first officially mooted according to the Olympic website in 1998 and didn't take didn't happen until 2007 is the first Youth Olympics but we've got the British public schools are doing a lot of things here 
to do a kind of quasi Olympic Games themselves over in Germany. So he's here doing the javelin um, and got the best throw of the day for 60 meters. Now I'm not a javelin thrower, so I don't know how uh, astonishing that is, uh, but they clearly had to give it up because of bad weather. But that's the youth games. But what we also had was a parent who won gold, Dick Southwood, who won gold for double skulls. And what I find quite telling in this photograph is that actually, clearly, if you're in a skull, you can hold your oars without having to do a Nazi, a German salute, uh, which everybody else is doing around you. So it's a, a little bit of protest going on here with the um, with uh, Southwood and his partner. But they were there in the 1936 Olympics. Again, we have a series of um, cancellations. We have the, um, the 1940 Olympics, clearly couldn't happen, or the 44. So the next time the Olympics uh, can be played, it comes to London in 1948. And again, we've got a rower. So we've got this wonderful thing of Paul Bircher. I remember meeting Paul a few years ago when we had um, an exhibition in the Art Centre about uh, people of Radley Reach and uh, a, a study by an artist of all the people involved with the river. Uh, and he rode in the British Eight to win silver. So this is the final. Um, USA won gold, um, Norway won bronze. So they're heading off there, down the Thames. But this was very much uh, a games of rationing, of cinder tracks, of uh, talking to Paul, very much um, done on a shoestring. But what I really like, if we're looking at a shoestring, is the Radleyans report on this. And at Radley, we're more concerned that he's now become the president of Cambridge University Boat Club and rowing five in the Cambridge Eight. By the way, he also rowed five in the Olympic crew. That's the only mention we have actually in the Radleyan of this, um, this wonderful achievement of winning silver. But in the same year, we have the uh, Winter Games at St. Moritz. For a very long time, uh, the, both games were run simultaneously in the same year. Well, not simultaneously, but they were run in the same year. Um, and the original idea was they would be in the same country, which obviously is not practical to have winter and summer sports necessarily hosted in the same country. Uh, but we've got uh, Peter Bumfrey here as part of the skiing team. So he's third from right. So one, two, three, I think, uh, there in the middle. Uh, and one of the things about this is that um, you're getting a widening of sports. So we talked a little bit about youth games coming in. Then we've got different types of sports coming in as well with the, uh, uh, with the winter sports. Originally, things like ice hockey were counted to be part of the summer games. Um, as was skating. It's one of the first seven British um, Olympic uh, sports. But um, gradually, all of these things became sort of separated out between the two. So we've got Saint Moritz in 1948, in the same year as London. And again, we're doing really well in winter sports. We've got Noel Harrison. Uh, Successful skiing champion, chosen for the Olympic skiing team in Norway. So here he is in Oslo and then in Cortina uh, in the men's slalom. And we're still getting people who are being selected, but not necessarily going too far. So in Melbourne, 1956, We've got four rowers, Gubbins, Langton, Rakes, and Thompson, invited by the selectors as potential crew. 
and then Nick Burke Byer representing at Rome in Double Skulls, and Rosalind Smith coaxed the Molsey Four in the Olympic Games. I'd really like to know quite what that means, but um, he is there in the Olympics as a cox, as well as rower. And hockey, again, we've got our member of council, Dr. Ari Fletcher, managing British hockey uh, at the Tokyo Olympics. He went on to become the president of All England Hockey. Um, so some people may remember him as a member of council there in Tokyo in 1964. And then we come to Innsbruck, also in 1964, and the bobsleigh team. So we've got Andy Hodges, Bill McCown, and David Lewis. David, are you there? Would you like to talk to us about the uh, the experience? Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, there we go. Okay, we can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, it was uh, something that was really terrific for me because I was not a a bobsledder, as it were, like McCowan and uh, Andy Hedges for anything like as long uh, as they were. But uh, my experience there was uh, uh, one of being very proud at representing Great Britain at the time. And uh, and uh, the fact that I was part uh, and honored, I was invited, as it were, to be part of the, the Nash-Nixon team, Nixon team, shall I say, uh, as the foreman, there was myself and Guy Rennick, uh, who's sitting on <clears throat> on the sled uh, next to Tony Nash, right. and Robin Dixon, and uh, we were the foreman. But the the one that we thought we were really going to do well with uh, was the two man, and so that Rennick and myself sort of worked as sort of helpers and engineers on anything we could do to get them. Uh, to the <clears throat> to the podium, and uh, fortunately for us and for everybody else, they took the gold, and that was a, a very very highlight moment uh, for us at that time. And here uh, they are, yes. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Tony Nash, who was actually also a Radley parent, so he had a, a Radley connection, winning the gold on the on the bobsleigh. So what is the experience like? I've, I've never been in, in a bobsleigh. It, it's, when I've seen it, it looks to be very fast and really quite scary. Yeah, well, it is, it is more so, I think, almost from a spectator's point of view than from a rider's point of view, <clears throat> mainly because uh, when you're going down the, the track, uh, you have to keep your head down, as you can see there, in uh, in the in the photograph, and as a result, all you see is is white walls, and you don't have anything like the comparison of speed when you're going past something white, as when you're seeing trees and everything else in the background. So from that point of view, it wasn't as scary, um, but uh, if you happen to have a, a a mishap, as it were, then then you certainly find out. Uh, that uh, the speed is really quite frightening. Mm. Well, I'm noticing um, in the photo here how close you are to the spectators. Oh, yes. Well, you know, you just that very rarely because of the design of the track, uh, very rarely do you see a sled go out over the top. Mm -hmm. It has it has happened, but uh, very rarely. And but they're not actually looking over the edge of the <laughs> of the track there. I don't think anybody's got his head looking over. In fact, they're not allowed to be that close. No, but I, I, I'm assuming they're on a stand considerably back, but- Yes, they are, yeah, I that, think. That's it. A, yeah. 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 So have you considered, uh, have you continued as a bobslayer? Uh, no, I, I finished actually after the Olympics. I was in it for three years. Uh, <clears throat> We, in 1962, 63, and 64. And uh, I uh, didn't have the time, as it were, to commit to that afterwards. 
I was invited to to join the group, and I, uh, you know, and the idea was that we would try and get Tony Nash and Robin Dixon onto the stand. And I committed to do it for three years, and then I had to go back to work, as they say. Right. <laughs> well, these are very much the the years when when I think um, Britain wasn't expecting to win um, many medals. So within the the the, the pers- as the sort of sum of all medals for Britain, this must be uh, quite mm-hmm. high up there. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Now, Bill McCowan was on the on, on the screen a little earlier, but I don't know if he's still listening and taking his picture off. But he he might well give you a comment. I saw him up just now, so you might want to address him. See if he's there. Are you there, Bill? No, it looks like we've we've lost him for the moment, but he might come back on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because he, he will give you more background than I can give you in as much that uh, he was at it for much longer. Well, I don't know that that's true, but... I don't know if it's oh, really. Lewis, man, it's lovely to see you and hear your voice. Well, well thank you, Bill. And uh, I'm sitting in the sunshine in Virginia, mm-hmm. having a nice glass of beer, and it's perfect. Oh, good. <laughs> and I must say, uh, my recollections of the '64 Olympics were were good. I was had a very bad time. I I couldn't drive the thing at all. I was tr- very poor at the Olympics, which was a pity because I rather fancied my chances. But I remember Nasho and Robin Dixon were fantastic, and that was an amazing thing to live through with them. But uh, good to hear you, David. Good to hear well, you. Thank you, Bill. We'll think of you. the good times we had on the cricket field, as in amongst other things. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, well, I, I think we're... Carry on, David. I'm just going to say, I'm not so sure we're talking cricket at this moment in time, but that's a whole different story. Bill and I were on the first 11 together, so. Right. I, this, is one of, this is one of the issues when we're looking at uh, Olympians is that how often the, the sport is, a, apart from all of the rowing, it, it's, it's very much something that an individual does or a sport which you, you can't gather together a big team from within the school. Um, but I don't think there's ever been any suggestion that cricket should become an Olympic sport. And I hope not. I don't think so either. <laughs> <laughs> but we did have rowing, of course, and that's a team yep. sport there. Yeah, right. that that is a team sport. But it, it does come down. It can be single skulls, double skull, uh, a, a, a single sculler, double skull. Oh, skulls, so yes, so double skull. Yeah, they've got all those options coming through. So, Bill, uh, how was did did you continue? With Bob Slayer. No, I didn't. I gave up after the Olympics because I was I had driven so badly that I was very discouraged, and I didn't fancy my chances in the '68 Olympics in Grenoble. Right. But no, I gave it up, and uh, it was a pity because I I enjoy my beer and my Olympian friends are terrific friends. Do you get to meet up very often? Not very often. I mean, occasionally, yes, and it's terrific. It's a uh, it's a wonderful thing to have done. My dad was an Olympian as well in 1932, and my uncle Jack Wilson was a very famous Olympian and won a gold medal in 1948. So I've got quite a lot of connections with the Olympic Games, which are all tremendous collections. And I think it's very clever, very smart of you, of Radley, to, to, to put yourself on the front line with this Zoom, because Radley and the Olympics really go hand in hand. I mean, I think Radley as an Olympian, is, it's got great things going for him. Yes, I think it, it very much 
goes with the ethos of the school. I, I think when, when I when I wrote um, when I wrote Underhold Stories and looking at the concept of beauty, I actually put sports into that section: the beauty of a mind and fair play, and uh, the beauty of of, of, a, of a body well honed to play sport. All of those things are sort of central to the ethos of the school. I think, um, and certainly one of um, one of Theo Cook's, I think the last book that he wrote was Sportsmanship and Character. It was all about that development of, of, of an Olympian's character. I think that's fair enough. And I think it's terrific of you to, to be doing this Zoom. <laughs> and I thank you for it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's something, it's actually Sophie's, uh, Sophie's suggestion that we should do this one. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased that she's asked for it because the research has been very interesting. And I should say at the moment, a lot of this research was initially done by Jock Mallard um, way back for the 2012 Olympics. And I've added to it a little bit, but a lot of the work was is Jock's. Wow. So we've got Innsbruck, 1964. And then this interesting thing, I don't think we've got the gymnasts, but one of the things that we had throughout the 1960s, we've got Stoughton Harris, who I'm sure some of you will remember, um, who did some very odd things. It looks very odd, which is the, the combined orchestra and gymnastics tours to Scandinavia. And last time I was looking at this, I was I was concentrating on the orchestra part of it because we were looking at the Stoughton Harris Prize for music. But actually looking at it today, I realized I, I sort of overlooked the gymnastics. And one of the things that he he did was was to make sure that the school actually had Olympic gymnastics or apparatus here in the Barker gym. Uh, and so we've got this wonderful piece of gymnastic history where when he took the, uh, took the team to Scandinavia with their two teachers, they had the first Olympic gymnastic competition on all six pieces of apparatus between schoolboys of two countries. So Denmark won, but this is very much um, an, an, an Olympic movement here in gymnastics. And in fact, he, they set up the, um, the gym so well and the equipment was so well done that the British national team uh, the following year, the following couple of years, actually came here to train. We never produced our own uh, gymnast as far as I can find out, but uh, we certainly had the equipment and the coaches and a series of tours to Scandinavia that went on for 10 or 15 years with orchestra combined. And I mentioned Jock. So Jock, as our resident Olympian for a very long time, uh, he has um, he declined. He didn't feel that he could speak about this because he, he said, I was just, I was a spare man. I was, I, I was 10 in the team, but goodness me, to even be selected. And here he is in the first eight in 1963. He's... Uh, a captain, so he's rowing there. Uh, there is our young, our young jock. Um, so going across to Mexico for '68, and we can then end up with quite a long string of rowers. So we've got Tim Crooks rowing for GB in Munich in '72, but being coached by Donald Leggett. Now that's that's um, that spelling error is jocks, not mine. I'll sort that out. Um, but uh, so we had Donald as coach. Uh, we had Tim uh, rowing. We had um, Sturge as spare man for the team. But we've also got the this, this squad here, Chris Bailier, Chris Blackwall, already picked for 27 oars when selected for Munich. So rowing at this point is clearly taking off. Uh, and a lot of that has got to do, I think, with... Um, uh, Roddy Howard's coaching very much at this point. And then we've got Donald, obviously, who's been coached as well. And that culminates in Montreal in 76. So we have Chris Bailier winning silver in the double skulls with Mike Hart. Uh, looking at the history of that, um, 
uh, Chris and Mike Hart seems to have won practically everything in double skull rowing for ages. Mark, are you uh, wanting to say something, Mark Hayter? Um, just to say that I too was at 1976 Olympics. Right. Uh, um, was there at the time with this. And of course, at the time, we were feeling quite um, pleased that we were getting on quite well there because this was a period when East Germany were doping all our mm. athletes. Mm. Uh, I was in the quad that year and uh, sadly didn't manage to make the final owing to an injury, but never mind, we were still there. And um, I well remember Tim and uh, Chris throughout my time uh, at Radley. Uh, although I have to say that they were in the first eight, I never made, I only made the second eight at, in Radley. I was a slightly late, late later bloomer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim has been uh, talking to us quite a lot at the moment because he's um, he's writing his autobiography. Um, yeah. And so he's doing quite a lot about um, uh, the coaching that he had uh, at school. Mm. Um, and it's thrown up one of the difficulties of the modern digital age, actually, because we don't have as good records now as we had back in the 60s of, of who is coaching which boat. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I obviously wasn't coaching then, although I, although I did coach a single scholar in the 1980 Olympics, which has possibly not appeared in the annals either, but that's neither here nor there, I guess. <laughs> she could not have been a Radlian. <laughs> Well, we've got the first eight here that you were just talking about. So we've got um, uh, Tim Crooks at six and Chris Balia at stroke. Yeah. So there they are. So there's Chris Balia. Uh, one, two, three, four. And there's Tim Crooks at six. Yep. Um, Curiously okay. enough, another, uh, I can't remember whether he actually was an Olympics or a, um, a world championship bronze medalist in the third eight that year. I think that was, it might have been Sturge, who we mentioned before, but I can't mm. actually remember very clearly in my head. So right. it's quite, a, quite a, a pick of a year as far as the rowing was concerned for Olympics and outside in World Championship rowing that, that, that particular season, yeah. if you might say. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And um, you've, got the, um, you've got the rowing team here. So Mr. Taunt, the boatman, who yep. comes up in a lot. Um, Ronnie Robert. Howard. Yeah, uh, remember him well. Uh, yes, he uh, Ronnie Howard only died a, a few years ago, not, not long, not long since, I think. Absolutely, absolutely, um, great, great shame is passing. But then so, we all we all come to that in the end. <laughs> so was he as as, as inspirational a, a school coach as it seems here when you look at these teams? I would say so. I mean, the very fact that Jock Mullard effectively took over from him mm. and all the crews of the period, first eight crews were coached by him and quite a lot of successes there. Uh, as I said, I didn't make the first eight, I was in David Hardy's second eight. And David was another inspirational coach, I would say, of the time. Well, I've got very, very detailed records from David. Uh, mm. Every mm. boat, every training session, as, as you can imagine. <laughs> yes. All of that is there. But yes, what we also have, here we are. I said David Mark Surge, Hater. yeah. Yep. Surge. David Surge, Mark Hater, Quad Skulls, uh, Chris, Blackwell, Chris. Chris Blackwell coaching the Cox pair. Yeah. Yes. And from an earlier generation, Peter Jackson, the umpire in the hockey uh, tournament. Uh, yes, he, he was at Radley before the war. Um, so we've got him here in his prefects, uh, prefects photo from... 19, I think 1949, it must have been just post-war. So hockey is still there as, 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 as one of the things that we are, we are looking at. And Moscow 1980, we have Chris Bailey on the double skulls coming forth. Now, uh, he was uh, chair of British Olympians, and is he still I, um, be part of that? I'm not sure that he's still chair. I can't remember. He lives not very distant away from me, along with two of my other former rowing um, colleagues, if I can put it that way, although they weren't in with Radley. He certainly still is uh, deeply involved in rowing, mm. which I, I regret to say I am not because I've had I've moved in other directions. But uh, 
but yeah, right. I would think if you were to contact Chris, he would still have plenty to say. Yes, yes, we we hope that he'd be able to join us today, but I I, I think um, a lot of those who are still involved in it Olympics are heavily um, booked up at the moment. So we come to that, uh, the first of the gold medals for rowing. So Richard Budget in the Coxed Falls, here he is at Los Angeles. Um, and obviously as a qualified doctor, he went on to a, a different route for an Olympian afterwards. Um, started off as doctor for the bobsleigh team uh, in 92, 94, and then chief medical officer for, for GB and is now medical and scientific director of the IOC um, and currently part of the prohibited list expert group for WADA. As I was driving in this morning, I was listening to one of the cyclists who was talking about uh, the, um, the problems of drugs and of um, uh, being tested and, and, and finding that she, she got a prohibited, um, uh, a prohibited substance had come up uh, which she had no idea that she'd ever taken as part of the uh, um, uh, a part of the other drugs that she was um, taking quite legitimately. And certainly I've had a um, very interesting talk to the boys by Sam Townsend here, the, um, the rowing coach, uh, where he's been talking about um, the effect of drugs in, uh, in the Olympics. And you've already talked, Mark, about um, the East German team being a problem. Yes, I think it was fairly well known that the whole state um, sports uh, uh, ministry, what I can call it that, in the East Germany um, was basically there wasn't a single East German athlete who hadn't been on a drugs program. Most of them, well, at least some of them unknowingly, but it was a, a, a normal thing around then, if you like, for, for East Germany and some some of the Russians, I, we believe, also at the time, whereas good old amateur GB at the time never even got a sniff of a drug apart from uh, uh, inhalers when you got asthma. <laughs> even that wasn't terribly good. Yes, but I think this was the uh, the cyclist this morning was. Uh, yes, talking I'm, about I'm pleased that. to say that she's been exonerated because if she's, uh, but it, the worst bit of uh, this particular instance is it's cost her about £40,000, her life, in uh, her and her complete um, meltdown psychologically and physically. Mm. So I think it's a very dangerous thing to just assume because there is a, a, a some drug there that it is always the person concerned is at fault as this particular instance does demonstrate. But it's certainly true to say that drugs have been a major part of um, Olympic sports for a very long time and the in the suggestion that there should be a, a drug inclusive Olympic at the same time, uh, fills with horror of so people such as myself who competed against those who did, mm. who were drug takers. Well, I, 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 I gather that part of the, um, part of the response to the, um, the drug taking from East Germany and so on was uh, to, to sort of relax the amateur nature of the games and bring in more professional sportsmen. Whereas we'd had a very, very strict, uh, no, uh, no professionals at all in any sport, hadn't we before that? Well, it's it's realistic to say that pre nineteen seventy six, possibly even still pre nineteen, including nineteen eighty, um, British rowing was amateur, and mm. most of us were having to hold down a job at the same time, training morning and uh, and evening, but going to work in the middle of the day as I did, um, but subsequently. Uh, the British rowing, as it was the only one of whom I can talk about and for, uh, have actually been able to support their athletes. Not, I wouldn't suggest that they are professional athletes in the sense that uh, you go to get Olympic, sorry, you get appearance money at things, which may or may not be true in the in the, in the 2000s. But for, for that later 19th, 20th century part of it, we were actually able to support our athletes such that they didn't have to work from nine mm -hmm. till five, or in my case, it was 9.30 till 4.30, because my employer was quite reasonable. But I had to stay at my desk during the, during the lunch hour instead. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, Tom had his hand up. Yeah, and yes, I was just going to say, one, I mean, 
with Richard Budget. I mean, on your early slides, you mentioned that the comment in the old Radleum was somebody rode for Cambridge and happened to row for the Olympics. But you now Richard, he was at Cambridge and obviously a very good oarsman. He never rode. He never rode for Cambridge. He never got brought into the Cambridge program. And it wasn't until he was doing his clinical doctor work with Tom Cadu Hudson at the University of London that they, well, <clears throat> they two of them were got a bronze in the GB Cox pair mm -hmm. against the Abagnoli brothers. And, it, and that sort of then got Richard, then went on up <clears throat> into the, um, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the Olympic four. Uh, so, and having sort of managed to sail under under the radar for three years at Cambridge. Um, and then, of course, Richard was part of the crew who launched Steve Redgrade onto his five medals. Yes. Yes, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it, that, that suddenly, suddenly we woke up and realised that uh, British rowing was doing astounding things and had been doing for several Olympics in a row. Um, so, but if if you weren't involved in rowing, it was sort of really slipping under the under the radar because there's so much emphasis on athletics uh, when you have uh, television coverage of the Olympics. So here we have the eight. So this is one of Jock Mollard's eights um, with uh, Richard Budget uh, uh, three. Is that the right way. Um, so there he is. Three and and, and Tom is at um, six. Tom Kedder Hudson. There yeah. he is. Yes, at at six. So there, um, and speeding through. Um, I'm guessing at Nottingham City Regatta, but I'm not sure. No, that, that's Henley. Uh, is that Henley? Yeah, yeah going past I the notice board. Should that. The, the progress board. <laughs> right. So Barcelona, we introduce another another sport. This is Mike Cash of 1981 um, at swimming, uh, coming 16th in the freestyle re relay. And I've put this photograph up. This this was given to me by uh, somebody who lives in Radley Village. Um, we used it for the book again. This is what Radley provided for him as a swimming pool. So this is the open air pool, which I gather David Hardy and various other people had boys out uh, helping to dig and create out there in the walled gardens before we had the whole of our um, uh, sports facility built. Um, so I'm I'm hesitating to say that Radley produced an Olympic row, uh, an Olympic swimmer from this pool. <laughs> That's what we made uh, what we provided for. Well, at least we all had to learn to row in it before, before learn to swim in it before we'd. Um allowed to row so that in that respect it was still a relevant and important part of our lives then <laughs> I've, I've got some um wonderful photos from the 1880s of swim tests taking part uh down by newnham actually in the river mm. and there's somebody in a boat and little heads bobbing up and down in the river yeah so a swimming pool was an advantage you think uh, oh, oh, distinctly. Right. Fla flatter water and no likelihood of anybody coming past in another boat <laughs> Well, before the uh, rowing tank was um, uh, opened here, of course, which is named after Jacques Mollard, um, we, we always had problems with the uh, with the shells being swept away in the floods. You must have all had flooding when you're trying to learn, um, and, and bank tubs being uh, being fixed, and a few of them trying to learn in College Pond as well, mm. because the the river was just not safe. And I, I put this in because it, there is a lot going on in the background. So here we are, Richard Ferrand providing essential for facilities at Lillehammer in 1994. So if anybody's looking for any of this sort of thing, I, this is obviously the person to talk to. So there he is, his mobile news upmarket functions, wallpaper, pictures, hand towels. But Atlanta, again, um, now we're beginning to actually move away from Team GB. Uh, so we've got Mark Rowland, Mark Rowland uh, rowing for South Africa, but also Martin Kennard of 1959, who's chief coach 
of a South African Olympic eight. So we're starting to look outside of uh, Team GB. And of course, um, John Gearing, who's been, uh, who was our coach uh, for, uh, he's been here for what, 15 or so years, maybe longer, uh, is also South African. And again, this is one of um, Steve Radgrave's uh, gold medals, isn't it? Sydney 2000 with Harry Marn, uh, the Radley coach, coaching the eights, winning gold at Sydney. And this lovely moment where the boat actually at Radley was named after him. I had a boy um, a couple of years back who did a research project on um, trying to find out what all the names of all the boats were and why they were called what they're called. Beijing 2008, again, we have a spare man. So we have Tom Parker. Um, 2012, there's no Radley in, but Sam Townsend did uh, row and also at uh, Rio uh, in the GB quad. And we end up where we're at at the moment, Tokyo 2020, with Tom George, Ollie Wing Griffith and Charlie Alwes winning bronze all rowing in the same Team GB boat. This is, is not actually a record. In 1908, um, the British Eight contained six Radleyans and the Copts. <laughs> so that's where, we, that's where we end. We've had others who have been connected with the school, who've, um, uh, who've taken part in various sports. And we have people who I think are hoping, I'm not sure how, who's been selected for Paris and who is in training for 2028. But we've obviously, we've been there through the Olympics all the way through, I think as David suggested, right at the very beginning, it's, it's, it's synonymous with us. So that's where I'm going to end. Um, and if anybody would like to come back, if there's anything else. But one thing I should say, of course, we, we've also got things like the Paralympics. Um, and as far as I'm aware, we, ha we haven't had a, a Radley and participating in the Paralympics. Uh, but the school did, a couple of years back, host the Transplant Games, which was quite an event um, with, uh, uh, I think, six or 800 athletes who had all had some form of organ transplant. Um, participating in uh, using the facilities right across the school. Um, and that again, I think is a biennial, uh, uh, a biennial games, obviously again, modeled on the Olympics. So is there anything else anybody wanted to come back with? No, just to say with Tom, Ollie and, and Charlie, I mean, they've all, you know, Tom, Tom and Ollie, I mean, they'd, Having got gold in the European mm. Championships and, and and Charlie in the eighth, I mean, all three of them are absolutely determined to be in the middle of the podium come Paris. And and, and the, the real test is the World Cup two at Lucerne next mm. this coming weekend because all the um, other crews are over, and they and the final Olympic qualifications regatta ended yet. Um, this morning, so they now know who is going to be competing in Who's the rowing at right. the Paris Olympics. Right, so they know what their opposition is going to be. Yeah, and, and they're well. I mean, the GB eight is um, hasn't been. I was unbeaten last year and mm. world champion. So there's, uh, I think all three of them are. I mean, the British rowing at Tokyo was such a complete mess and <laughs> a foul up that they're all determined to, you know, to do. Uh, Bronze was great for one of the British crews to get a medal, but bronze wasn't what anybody wanted to get. When we were looking for um, uh, inspirational old Radleyans for the shells to do a series of paintings about, which is all down covered passage. So if you if you visit the school, you'll find we've got the um, timeline history of the wall of, uh, of the school on one side, down covered passage, and at the moment, a series of. Um, portraits of old Radleyans, which the Shells did. And I gave them a list of um, people they might want to include in this. 
and they absolutely insisted that they were going to make a portrait of this photograph. That those were their heroes of the uh, heroes of the hour in 2020 that they responded to. So we see we, we go past that every day. So Sophie, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Claire. That was um, absolutely fascinating and just a real delight to listen to what an amazing roster of sporting people. It's incredible. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us on the call. What an amazing treat to have so many Olympians um, on the call and participating and sharing your memories. That's been absolutely lovely. Thank you. Our next archives event will take place in November and we'll look at the Radley Combined Cadet Forces, the CCF. Um, we've actually had loads and loads of memories come in from um, the community uh, about the CCF already. So it should be a really interesting and lively call. Um, but if you're someone who hasn't shared your memories yet of the CCF and you've got some, please do um, get in touch and share those with us because that will be really lovely to have that and make sure you get onto the call as well. So thank you so much for joining us and for being here this evening and have a lovely rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Sophie. Thank and you. thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that you could all join us. Um, it was a pleasure and a lot of fun. Good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone.